Claire and hi everyone. Thank you for a very nice introduction and most of all, thank you for inviting me for this very exciting online seminar opportunity. I think it's one of the most amazing things I've seen online recently and I've seen a lot of things online recently. So let me start sharing my screen. Now, as I declared in the, the abstract of the topic, I'm going to talk about everything that tends to hide underneath the general signal that you get from your, um, from your sample. And why is it interesting? Because of many reasons that I would like to discuss, most of which the fact that when you look especially at transition metal oxides, because I like them and I think they're awesome, and they're awesome because they can do a lot of things. Most of the stuff, they are not even included in this slide because the field is so wide that we will spend ages just trying to discuss what you can do with the transition metal oxide. And most of these things have been uh, deemed as industrially applicable because they are bulk property. We put a stamp on it and we call it a day. So we like them so much because if you make a material, you expect it to behave exactly in the same way, regardless of how big you make your sample, which is pretty handy if you want to scale up this thing industrially and you want to make sure that the piezoelectric material in your watch will always behave in the same way, no matter how big it is. And uh, the magnets in your hard driver, they will always behave in the same way. So we are kind of sure that we could label them as bulk properties, but even just for solid state batteries, for instance, there is a very extensive field of research in which you try to figure out what exactly is your material doing to allow this lithium ion, for instance, to go from one side to the other without disrupting the architecture. So there must be something, and there is often something, not in every case, but in some very relevant cases, that is sort of hiding in the bulk and is giving rise to your properties. Now, I'm not asking you to believe me just because I sound sure of what I'm saying. We could actually see some examples, some of which I worked in personally throughout my career. Now, the first example is exactly what you, will, you would expect from me because it's a significant part of my PhD. So a significant part of my PhD was on magnetite, which is iron 304, is a very well-known uh, magnetic material. It's also an electronic conductor, and it's also one of the first materials that have been sold by the Bragg's in 1950. So it's a very old material, very well established, and it's established as a cubic material, inverse spinel, in which the interesting thing is this nice framework of octahedra that are all uh, edge sharing. Like you see them here sharing this little side of the octahedral network. And the other interesting thing is that they are inherently mixed valence. So when you get magnetite, magnetite has iron in three plus and two plus state sharing this octahedral position. So depending on where you are, statistically speaking, there must be a distribution of iron three, iron two. And this is what gives rise to the very strong conductivity of magnetite. It's basically semi-metallic. It's huge. It's one of the most conductive transition metal oxide that you can find. And everything is fine, it's ferromagnetic. Sometimes you find it laying around as a mineral inherently magnetized, which was very historically relevant because you could do compass from this. So it seems awesome to begin with, but there is a tiny little but hanging around. If you cool it down below 125 Kelvin, this material has one of the most well known metal to insulator transitions um, of, uh, of all the fields of material science. Uh, and it shows as a discontinuity in all the properties, not just the conductivity. Whatever you measure is gonna have a discontinuity and your nice 
cubic spinal structure is going to be disrupted. You don't keep it to very low temperature. This was actually discovered in 1939, so it's not, again, a very recent thing, but trying to study this thing and finding a model to this thing that will actually fit to what was happening has been a very long debate. So you can see it here, the conductivity going down, a very nice first order transition. If, the reason I put insulator in like little uh, quote marks is because someone might be very picky and say this is kind of like a semiconductor conductivity. It's true. So if you want to call it semi metal to semiconductor, is actually accurate. And of course, the idea here, the uh, original idea was that something must have happened to the charges for this to go disrupted. Because if the conductivity is coming from this little extra electron that differentiates a 2 plus from a 3 plus hopping around, if you separate two plus, iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus in the hot tahedral framework, then you possibly stop the conductivity. But as I said, it was not quick coming, the real answer. The real answer came only in 2012, which is now almost a decade ago, and I feel very old saying that. But what you can see, especially when you go into a synchrotron, is that you go from uh, your very nice cubic structure to a very subtly distorted structure with a lot of superstructure reflection. So if you just look at the patterns that I took a frame here, they don't look very much different, but if you pay attention here, there is this little scatter of tiny peaks that come from a monoclinic superstructure that is arising, disrupting the cubic structure. Now, the good thing and the complex thing about this stuff is that it comes from a lot of distortions. So every atom in, the, the, in your monoclinic structure is slightly shifted from its ideal cubic position. So it's 168 cooperative distortion. They are mostly driven by the fact that iron 2 plus is the antiler active. So when you freeze it down, you cool it below 125 Kelvin, at some point you will freeze the Yanteller distortion and the Yanteller distortion will drive this modification of the structure. Now, since there are so many, there is not a single thing that drives the distortion. It's everything moving off. And the answer about what is happening to the charges is a bit more complex than a simple charge order is this deformation of this sort of trimeron structure. We call it a trimeron because it's a three atom orbital molecule. So you basically put your iron two plus in the center with two iron three pluses on the side. And this region in between becomes a delocalization region. And this is possible because these are, these are all octahedra that are sharing some space. So if you compress an axis because of the anteller distortion, they get close enough to each other to delocalize the minority spin electron. So this is not news, but it's very good crystallographic world. I will, I will uh, advise you to check out the paper if you're curious. I don't want to run you through how do you figure this out because this is known now. I would like to point out that there is something in magnetite that is remarkably weird, even in what you should consider the easy part, the cubic part, the one that we thought it was perfectly established. The reason we can say there is something profoundly weird is that there, even in the old days, they could figure out that there was something in the physical properties that was not quite adding up with what you would expect from a cubic semi-metallic spinel. And it really um, like shows up in a lot of um, tricky properties like the charge gap formation every time you measure um, photoelectron spectroscopy or in elastic uh, X-ray scattering. You see something going on that should not be there above the transition. So if you look at the patterns, even though I'm not an expert on this thing, they all say that 
there is a feature that is persistent, that is coming up from the low temperature and is persisting above the vertebrae transition, even though you would expect it to be a fine, perfectly cubic, perfectly undistorted, very much well-measured sample. So your bulk properties that you are uh, entrusting for compasses even and something like that is doing something that you don't quite expect. Now your smoking crystallographic gun that tells you that you could get an answer by looking at the structure is that uh, even in 1976 they figure out that even if you warm up uh, away from the verve transition you will see diffuse scattering. So this is not like this, this is a very old work and this is very recent work, but it's not the clear pattern that you would expect. They are not just Bragg diffraction, there is something additional. Now, in this seminar series, you had a lot of good speakers talking about total scattering and stuff like that. I don't want to repeat what people even better than me already explained, but we can do a quick run through so that we're all on the same spot here. So the Bragg diffraction, the one that we are all obsessed with as crystallographer, is all of these spots that you get in your, um, in your frames. And they represent the long range crystalline feature. So your crystal is a big, average, nice framework. It all diffracts in the same way. This gives rise to the Bragg diffraction. Whereas if you were to measure a glass or a liquid, you won't have a framework that is all coherent in itself, and this will lead to a continuous scattering. So these are the two ends of the deal, a completely disordered material in which you cannot expect a stable framework, and a very ordered material in which you expect everything to diffract in spots. There is the middle ground, which is very much interesting and has been gaining a lot of traction in the last decade, I would say, which is the structured continuous scattering that arises from within a crystalline structure. So this is something more like this, the diffuse scattering that you see in magnetite. And it's uh, what we call diffuse scattering is not these points over here, but the shadows that you see in between and that are modeled over here in the old paper figure. This diffuse scattering comes from the correlated disorder. So this is not something that your structure is able to propagate in the same way it propagates the atomic arrangement. It's something that is constrained to a very small scale. So it's not able to diffract like a crystal with a Bragg diffraction. It's still diffracting something. It does it a bit more like a liquid, but it's not completely unstructured because it's still something that obeys to the order that you have within your crystalline framework. So the continuous structured scattering is something that comes from the short range feature of this order of atoms seeing each other a bit too much or a bit too strongly. Now in normal crystallography, you deal with the background in the same way you deal with any type of background. So any type of shadow, will actually be swallowed up by you modeling the background. You just rise your background uh, level or you model the background with something a bit wavy and you swallow it up and you still see your Bragg diffraction and you're able to solve whatever you want to solve from the Bragg. But the last 10 years and so on have been shown that, has shown that you could do total scattering analysis, especially when you do it with Padua, is very well established as a technique. So instead of working in reciprocal space, which is what gives you the points of the Bragg diffraction, you work in real space. So what you need to do is you Fourier transform your Bragg spots and everything that comes with the scattering into the real space. And at that point, instead of having planes of a crystalline structure diffracting, you get a weighted histogram of the bond distribution in your structure. So that's a real space analysis and really tells you from zero Ongstrom going on 
with the distance what is happening to the bond in your structure. Now, if you've already seen PDF, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't seen it, it might sound a bit confusing, but it's actually very handy if you try and think about the fact that we're trying to see here if there is something going on with atoms getting a bit too close with each other. So one of the big, big deals with magnetite is that since the lowering of symmetry is so severe, it goes from cubic to monoclinic, doing experiments in single crystals is the only way to get a very nice atomic resolution, but your single crystal will twin. It will always absolutely twin. There is nothing you can do to avoid it. You can reduce it. Avoiding it completely is almost impossible because it comes from the symmetry. Now, if you use powders, you avoid the twinning because you're just doing the statistical distribution going all around, and you can use the pair distribution function, which is treating your total scattering in real, um, in real uh, space and get a weighted histogram of everything that you're doing within your bond structure. Now, the way we designed the experiment when we decided to look into this diffuse scattering feature and try to get an answer about what is happening with this structure is that magnetite has the very, very transition and it has the Curie temperature of magnetic disorder. So the best way to actually span through everything this structure can do is going from below the very, very temperature when you expect your thing to be trimeral ordered like this. So you have your two, two plus, three plus, three plus all structured together in this very funky shape. Go above the very, very transition, which is the normal state of magnetite, technically cubic, ferrite magnetically ordered, and then warm up even higher and go to a complete disorder, something that even um, accounts for the spin disorder, which is above the Curie temperature. So the range of temperature that we used was 90K to uh, 923 Kelvin. So this is all the possible transitions, but it's also a very huge range. So it's not possible to cover it with one simple sample environment. You need to switch sample environment midway through, which is already a pain and it will be very challenging to do with single crystals because you will be heating up your sample without a protective environment whereas you can load uh, your um, your padware into a capillary under argon and then it's protected against environmental oxidation so to do this we went to the srf beamline id 11 that can work with a very low wavelength. You need that because you're using iron. You want to be away from the edge of uh, absorption of iron. Otherwise, you get basically resonant X-rays, which is not what you want. Uh, a very good detector camera and a high uh, Q range of collection. So you need to be able to collect very far away to be able to get very short distances uh, with enough resolution. We had to change sample environment, so we went with nitrogen from 90 to 400 Kelvin and then switched over and went from almost 500 to the very high temperature with a hot air blower. Now, what do we get from that? A lot of data, like a lot of data. But also some problems. Because, as I told you, the distortions that give uh, rise to the very, very transition are numerous and very small. So when you go and look at the histogram of your bond distribution, you're basically looking at atoms that are shifting just a tiny bit and a tiny bit that is not necessarily depending on thermal expansion. So when you look at the, at the data as a as a thermal scan, so these are all, not all the scans that we took, at least the selection of the scans that we can see. Seeing the differences in this pattern, even by eye, is not easy. Like, you could see that the first, um, so these are, this is just the first coordination shell, so iron-oxygen distances, iron-iron distances in the octahedral position, which are the closest one. You 
could say that yes, okay, below uh, the vertebrae transition, you have this little tail bumping up uh, which shorter distances, there should be the smoking gun of a trimeron. But above that, everything looks sort of the same. It would be very difficult to argue that you have a different pattern. They look functionally similar and this little... Uh, deviations might be swallowed up by the the thermal um, broadening of your distribution. So this is a moment in which trying to use a single crystal derived uh, model into a powder diffraction really clashes with the limit of the two techniques because you're using atomic distributions that have been refined in single crystal, which is excellent for atomic positions, into a powder sample that is not meant to give you that type of resolution. You cannot freely refine the atomic position in this model. It won't make any physical sense. And actually, your, mo- your modeling program won't like it. It's too many variables. You're overfitting the pattern. But that doesn't mean that you cannot try and fit the model that you have to the distribution that you have. So for instance, this is a 90K pattern, so very strongly below the vertebrae transition. You can see that it gives a sort of feasible fitting to the cubic, which tells you how tiny these these distortions are, but a much better fitting to the monoclinic. So you have these two models that have been refined with single crystal X-ray diffraction, so they are the atomic position as per- precise as you can get them. And then there can, could be something in between. So the fact that you can refine the set model tells you also something that you could do about this. Now, you could see the difference between these two. You have to trust me, this is undistorted and this is completely distorted by I is almost impossible to see, but this is generated with isodistort, so like moving the structure back and forth. And in this moment, when I could not refine the atomic position freely, my PhD supervisor told me the fact that the program cannot do it doesn't mean that you cannot do it. Do it like we used to do in the old days, create the model and make the fitting. So you could use the amount of diffraction of um, distortion as your modified parameter. So basically you're shifting manually, creating a new model with lower shifting. So at shifting value, vertebrae fraction zero, your structure is completely undistorted. And then you do fractions and fractions and fractions of the distortion up to the monoclinic model, which is completely distorted. And then you go to over, just for due diligence, 120% distortion. What can you give? And then for every one of these models, you fit. What you get at the end of this is something not so horrifying. I'm sure you also worse data to work with, but it does require a lot of fitting. So for every shift that you created, you need to fit every temperature all the time. So everything has been done the same way. So for every temperature, there will be a goodness of fit of how good your fit is handling the the actual experimental data. And then you start seeing something interesting because this thing has a distribution. You could fit the distribution with this mixed polynomial exponential thing. And at that point, you start to see a trend in your data, which is what we like in life. Since you get your minimum, you could also derive which one is, which uh, verve shift is the best fit for every temperature. So you can see that for the, for, for the two lowest temperature, we have no doubts that your 100% distorted monoclinic is the best fit. But above the vertebrae temperature, you start to see something very interesting, which is the minimum of this distribution of RW is not on zero, is in another place. And it keeps being into another place as you warm up 
and it keeps doing that even at high temperature, you really need to go to incredibly high temperature to deal with this properly. Okay. And that leads us to the big bulk of this, um, of this work, which is this plot. So this plot is this same procedure repeated for one unit cell, two unit cell, three unit cell of your crystal. So if you look at the first unit cell, so it's within nine Ohmstrom, more or less, you could see that at the very, very temperature, so around 100 Kelvin, you have 100% of distortion, then you drop around the vervey temperature, but you really stay there at almost 80% distortion all the way above room temperature, sensibly above room temperature. And then you start going down only at very high temperature. And the moment you get to zero is the Curie temperature of your material you still have some distortion also in the second shell, so in the second uh, unit cell of your sample, so between nine, from 9 to 17 Ohmstrom, more or less, but that goes down much faster. And instead, at the third unit cell of your, um, of your magnetite, everything goes to completely undistorted uh, just above the very, very temperature. So this tells you why we are looking at a local effect. And why is this a local distortion? Because it cannot go further from two unit cell. It just doesn't exist above two unit cell. So within two unit cell, you have this distortion, otherwise it gets disrupted by the cross correlations. So here you have a long range trimer order, and here you have a fully disordered, even not magnetic structure. And you can see here that you're doing something interesting with your trend, which is following the drop in magnetization as you uh, heat up the magnetite. So the uh, iron 304 is locally distorted up to the Curie temperature. And the magnetism, which is absolutely something that you would consider a bulk property of your sample, is actually sort of correlated with the distortion of this thing. So probably the magnetic nature of these irons is helping the structure stay locally distorted. And of course, you keep getting diffuse scattering all the way. And of course, you keep getting anomalies all the way because this structure, which is one of the most well-known cubic structures in existence of crystallography is locally not cubic. So this was my first case in point, part of my PhD. And then I went to do more of the same but different stuff for the postdoc. So in my postdoc, I looked at oxygen ion conductors. So this is another case in which you, your structure is doing something very interesting but that sort of requires you to think critically about what possibilities do you have. Because uh, an oxygen ion conductor requires you to move O2 minus, so something with a diameter of almost three Ohmstrom, all throughout the structure and go from one side to the other and spit it out on the other end. This is the way fuel cells work. So we know it's possible because we saw it in news. We saw this, the, um, our samples doing it, our materials doing it. And again, it's something that you consider a bulk property, but oxygen must move away from crystallographic position. So this is something that is usually addressed as, oh, the structure needs to be flexible. But it's a good question to try and figure out uh, what is happening into a structure that allows you to have oxygen ion conductivity. Now, a lot of very interesting oxygen ion conductors, especially for modern age state-of-the-art applications are perovskite based. And perovskites, 90% of the people that are around here probably know what they are. So it's this type of structure when completely undistorted, it's cubic and um, 
you have a B site that is, again, your whole tahedral position that is completely equivalent. Like you could put different cations, but everything that you put there will be equivalent by symmetry. But you also have perovskite derivative structures, like a bromillerite, in which not only you have a distortion of, um, of your hot tahedra, which as is very common in um, perovskites, it can be just a tilting of your octahedron, but also non-rigid body behavior, so making a tetrahedron out of an octahedron and actually um, remove the, the oxygen. So you have oxygen vacancy order and this sort of distortion behavior. One thing to notice is that in uh, none of this structure, the oxygen occupancy is full because otherwise if everything is full, why are you moving things? What is initiating the movement? So you have some freedom to let out some oxygen and at some point you kickstart stuff. And very interestingly, this material over here, which is a strontium scandium gallium oxygen 2.5, uh, which I mm, intimately call SSGO because it's faster to pronounce it, uh, can be synthesized in either or this thing. So you could make a bromillerite out of this, but you could also synthesize a perovskite if you synthesize it in different conditions. And once you make the perovskite, the perovskite is stable. So this material has a standard polymorphism of you can make a bromillerite, you can make a perovskite, just decide what you want. Both of these materials are oxygen ion conductors, which means that if you bring them to a temperature higher than 500 degrees usually, you really see a drop in the weight of your material because it's physically spitting out oxygen and losing weight by doing it. But that leads us to the question, how do you do it? How is it possible? Especially if you're saying that this and this basically have a coherent oxygen conduction behavior, even though they are completely two different structures. Now, to do this, we went to a neutron facility, not an X-ray facility, on the ground that we're very interested on what the oxygen is doing. If you're interested on what the oxygen is doing, you don't go to a synchrotron, not preferentially, you go uh, to a neutron facility. So we went to D4, which is, again, very um, specialized in total scattering technique, disordered material, liquids, and stuff like that, to be able to apply PDF all over again. So again, with a powder sample of both material, we went there, we measured in a PDF available um, structure. So something for which you have a very good background, you're sure what, to cons what comes from your sample, what comes from your um, instrument. And we measured both the bromillerite and the perovskite material from room temperature to very high temperature, just to cross over the limits of oxygen ion conductivity, see if something changes and stuff like that. Now, the bromillerite has a, a north rhombic K to um, MB uh, space group, and the perovskite is the usual uh, PM minus 3M cubic. When you collect the long average um, just reciprocal space signal of a powder diffraction, you can see immediately that these, thing are, these two things are different. They are two different average structure. You can see, for instance, here you have different amount of peaks. And this peak over here, um, which is like split in three, in the case of the bromillerite, is just two in a sort of different position. So really the planes in these two structures are completely different. The amount of reflections is completely different. They are two different structures. There is no doubt on one is a bromillerite and one is a perovskite. Things kind of change in the moment you Fourier transform these reciprocal space patterns and you go into the real space distribution. So what happens when you go there is that what is technically your cubic sample and what is technically your bromillerite sample becomes a bit weird to distinguish because I could argue that these two distributions look more similar to each other than they look similar to 
a technically perovskite bond distribution. So this is the place where a perovskite uh, scandium gallium bond uh, with oxygen should be. And instead, in this case, unlike with magnetite, you can immediately see that something is going wrong with the distribution because the peak is splitted. So there are bond distances that are shorter and bond distances that are longer. They are not equivalent. And even here, the peak, there is not a single peak here. I would argue that these are most likely three peaks. So we could say overall that your um, local structure of a perovskite looks remarkably similar to the, the local structure of a bromillerite. So this thing, the red pattern actually fits nicely with the distribution of bonds in a bromillerite. The cubic doesn't fit with a cubic. It looks more like a bromillerite, especially within the first unit cell, which is this span that I'm showing over here. So this is, again, the big result that we get over here. So it's virtually impossible to fit that first unit cell with a cubic perovskite. If you manage, tell me, because I don't know how to do it. But you can fit it with very good results with just using an orthorhombic model. So you can see that this is a very good fit. You can even see it enlarged over here. So it fits everything nicely. You can put everything together. But above the first unit cell, the fit is pretty convincing just going with a perovskite. So you could say that for um, a distances shorter than five Ohmstrom, so within the first unit cell, the structure is functionally a bromillerite. And then as you go to longer distances, the differences even out and you get a cubic perovskite. That is the thing that gives you the average diffraction of a perovskite. But locally speaking, this thing is distorted. And you could argue that this is probably what is giving the space and the flexibility to your perovskite to conduct oxygen, even as it does, as it, does it with a bulk property. So if you put a huge volume of your perovskite, it will conduct oxygen, but the effect is coming from within this distortion, most likely. Now, that we, now that we put the two cases that I wanted to discuss, I could also discuss some work in progress, irksome moment. The first one, so this one has a local oxygen and uh, oxygen vacancy and cation order, we're all happy. But what irks me is that I cannot get my hand around having a smooth model of transition. So you could see here that if you try and fit the second unit cell with an orthorhombic model, so still a bromillerite even on the second unit cell, the fit is not that good, but honestly not that bad. When you try to go to the third unit cell, it really becomes atrocious. So this is not a good fit and not what you would expect from a good PDF fitting. So we could say that over here, most likely this thing should be a perovskite over here, you could still have some values of bromillerite. So why are we not doing here the same stuff that we did with, um, with the magnetite, in which I did the smooth model of let's lower the distortion, how much distortion do you have there? The reason we are not doing that is because, technically speaking, I2MB and um, PM minus 3M are group subgroup of each other. So you can get from one to the other just with the distortion of the bonds. And you can see that I try to do that here using isodistort once again. So this is the cubic model. This is the completely distorted orthorhombic model. But you have two issues that make this thing not a bromillerite. So this thing still has all the coordination um, of around scandium. So in theory, this thing should have scandium and gallium sharing the, um, the whole tahedral position. But here I made the model just with scandium. And in reality here, then you get scandium here, gallium here, scandium here, gallium here. You should have cation order. Cation order disrupts 
whatever like mechanical distortion you could have around. It's not like in magnetite in which is the same cation with a different oxidation state. It's a different cation. Second thing is that the oxygen vacancy order disrupts the coordination shell around the octahedron. So these things that are very much distorted are not octahedrons, they are tetrahedrals, but of course within a mechanical distortion group to group relationships so or a distorted phase transition, they should still have their oxygen. So I honestly haven't found an ev a very elegant way to do this nicely. But I know that there must be a smooth way because your structure is showing you a smooth way. So it's showing you that you can have an average cubic sample with a property that comes from what is evidently a bromillerite in the local scale. So there must be a way to arrange it elegantly. And this way is the thing that gives you the oxygen conductivity because then there is space for this oxygen to go over that and then go over that and jump around and get from one side of a structure to the other. The smooth transition model is my wish at the moment. It's something that I'm working on. It's a good, I find it a good crystallographic question, but then you need to actually play around and try to find an answer for yourself without uh, like just tossing it to the program and hoping that the program will have the best answer that you can get. There are some models of vacancy order, so I just need to work on this a bit more. Second thing is how to build up the diffuse scattering. So this is relevant for both um, magnetite and uh, the oxygen ion conductors. So whereas your PDF analysis is on PADWARS, so orientational average, you actually get a signal from the single crystal, which is the, the first thing I showed you, the shadows. So this is actually um, scandium gallium in uh, ESRF. So you can see the structured diffuse scattering and it will, uh, it will have a very um, ma a big amount of 3D correlated disorders. So you actually pinpoint everything better with the atomic resolution. But, 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 not only you need very, very good stuff, so a very good synchrotron with a very good detectors, and also the data analysis is hellish. So there are very few people that can do diffuse scattering analysis properly. And this is my second wish, and I will be working on it. I'm working on it at the moment. I'll let you know how it ends. So these are our conclusions. I hope I actually convinced you that, yes, you have bulk properties that are coming and going and influ being influenced by the local structure of your sample. So it's worth looking at any deviation you might have in your physical properties from a crystallographic point of view. To be continued, the comprehensive short, lane, short range, long range model, and 3D local features. Thank you for your attention, and thanks also to the people that enabled me both with support and expertise to do this thing, and the central facility that hosts me. And I'm happy to take any question. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.